welcome to a very special episode of the Cross-Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from around the globe. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community in their own country a better place for everyone there. Now, in today's special episode, we are going down under to Australia, to the city of Glen Ira, to sit down with Councillor Jim McGee. Jim, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down with me on this beautiful, for you, Monday, for me, Sunday night, and talking about local governance. But I want to start with you, and I want to start with a question I've asked every single guest who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception to that, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jim? Chris, I've got absolutely no idea. Um, I... My family immigrated to Australia back in 1970 from Belfast, Northern Ireland, where, as you know, back in the 70s and late 60s, there was a lot of trouble. We moved away to get away from that. Um, I've just loved the minute I set foot in Australia. I've just loved it. And it's I think it's a, it, within my core to give back and make where I live a better place. I've always been a volunteer been volunteering for well over 50 years. Um, it's just it's a natural thing to do, um, getting involved. I look at government, I look at federal government and state government and local government, and I see that really they are the, the, the catalyst that makes our lives really uh, benefit or put pressures on. I just felt like I needed to have a voice at that table. That was, was simply it. That was simply it. I, I, I do know there's a swimming pool story in, involved as well, because I listened to your interview on VA, VLGA Connect with Chris Eddy. But before cool. we get to that swimming pool, I want to talk about your upbringing a little bit, because you talk about you immigrate, emigrated to Australia from Northern Ireland, from Belfast. Was mom and dad yeah. political or are you sort of the black sheep of the family and decided I, to go into politics? I'm absolutely the black sheep of the family. Um, my parents, even today, have no interest in politics whatsoever. My mother, I've been in local government now. I've finished 15 years in local government. I'm in my 16th year. She's never once once watched a council meeting, um, has never taken engaged in anything I do on, in local government. As to, uh, she heard me on the radio one day and she rang me straight up and says, you're grandstanding, don't ever grandstand. Go figure. So my parents had no no inklings of uh, pol policies or politics. Um, I don't know where it came from. It's just, I love it. So you, you could have chosen many different routes to give back to your community. But in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, 2015, uh, there was a pool issue about being closed and you decide to throw your name in the, the ring. Why sure. give back local government wise? Why not through nonprofits? Why not through volunteerism? You chose the, sure. the municipal route. Sure. sure. I was already doing um, everything through the nonprofit sector. I was on the board of a, uh, a center for people with disabilities trying to find workshops, um, employment. I was, you know, ran a surf club. I, uh, you know, was in the local cricket club, footy club, soccer club. It's been my whole life as, as part of that junior um, cricket, junior sporting just, um, things. I have two boys, Chris, Daniel and Joseph. Now, Daniel and Joseph loved our local swimming pool. And one day I got a note saying that the council could no longer afford to keep the pool open. It was costing half a million dollars a year to maintain. And one of the options was to close it, turn it into a netball centre, which is terrific. But I thought, no, we really need our pool because we have a beautiful netball centre one kilometre to the north. So we started a little parent group and we called ourselves the Northern Memorial Action Group. So all of a sudden I became an activist and we lobbied council. And well, today there's a centre called um, GSAC, Glen Iris Sports and Aquatic Centre. Um, and I was lucky enough to get beyond council and we got it built. And it's to date, it's still one of the most profitable um, sports and aquatic centres in the country. And to the point where we've just started building a second one at Carnegie, the first six star, green star rated, only the few in the world. And we've got one well underway. I'm assuming in your time in office, local government has changed a lot. And I say that because I see this happening here in Canada. And yeah. I, this is where I want to start talking a little bit about the role of a councillor, the role of mayor, the role of local governance. In your time, what has been the biggest change that you have personally seen that local governance was dealing, wasn't dealing was dealing with in 2014, 2015, when you were first elected, that's dealing with it now? 
Chris, I'd have to say accountability. When I first got onto council some 15 years ago, social media was very in its infancy. <laughs> there was, you know, you weren't criticised for every time you scratch your head during an interview. Um, you know, people were getting to you 24-7. You're getting text messages. Um, you're getting Facebook posts um, telling you what a great job you're doing, what a terrible job you're doing, or have you thought of this? The difference in the interaction with community has changed immensely. And post-COVID, it's changed even again. Um, COVID really hit our city very, very hard. Victoria, in, in particular, well, I think has the unenviable um, reputation of being the most locked down city in the world. You know, over two years, we were locked down. We could barely move. Um, arguably, hundreds of thousands of lives, so they say, saved. But we still lost a lot of people. And it cost our council an awful lot of money in subsidising, helping communities, helping businesses, you know, letting people um, delay paying their rates, which, of course, reduces the amount of money that council has to provide the services. Now, we provide 120 different services, so we are really reliant. Nearly 60% of our income comes from rates. Um, the, I'd say the big difference for us is, is the accountability because more and more people actually understand what local council does. They sometimes don't um, differentiate between local government, state government, federal government. Now, we have three tiers of government. Local government is not in our constitution. We're not recognised as a government. We're just, we're a service provider. So federal government funds state government, state government fund uh, local government as well as rates. But Chris, we collect 3.8% of rates, 3.8% of taxes. And I'll call it a tax, not a rates, taxes. Yeah. Yet as councils, we actually look after one third of this nation's infrastructure. We do that with 3.8% of rates. How's that, how's that even possible? But we do it. Because we do it because we are not the ones that are sort of uh, can hide. I go down to my local shops and I hear about the footpath. I hear about the tree. I hear about the pothole. Um, you know, my local state member and my federal member, you know, wouldn't hear about those things. But I do because I'm in my community. I'm in my local cricket club. I'm in, you know, sports clubs. And I'm out. I'm very, I'm very physically present. So um, I'm finding that over the years now, I've just ended my 16th year, but Chris, that's a really good thing. You need to hear about these things because if you don't hear about them, you can't bloody well fix them. So I really enjoy that part of it, but it does wear you down. But certainly social media is playing a big part, but a, a part that's you know has a lot of benefits as well as you know its trials and tribulations. I literally felt like I was talking to a Canadian politician there because what you just said is what I'm hearing across Canada about infrastructure yeah. deficit, about federal and state, uh, well, in our country, uh, provinces and territories taking more money from cities and municipalities yeah. and funding yeah. other issues where they're left holding the bag. How do you do that in Australia then? How do you do that for Glen Ira? Because you're just coming off of your a third term as mayor. You're now sitting as a councillor. How does Glen Ira make sure that the funding that you have goes okay. to the correct spots? Chris, that's incredibly difficult. Um, <laughs> we we have in, in Victoria, and it may be similar in parts of Canada, a thing called a rate cap. The Minister for Local Government sets the cap the rates can increase by. Yep. used to be you worked out how much money you needed to run your city, you set your rate cap, and people paid according to the value of their property, whether it increased or decreased. But over the years, inflation, like last year, the rate cap was set at 1.75%. Inflation was over 8%. We were going backwards quickly. Now, how do you keep that going? You start looking at services. Do we need to provide that service? We luckily haven't pulled any services yet, but we are absolutely on the edge of pulling services. And as you're seeing the same system throughout some of the UK, we've got those councils in the UK have gone bankrupt. You know, it is very, very challenging. Our ratepayers don't understand that. They say, well, you know, why don't you just do that? Why don't you fix my footpath? And I say, I've got 840 kilometres of footpaths. You know, most of them over 100 years old. Infrastructure is a, is a really big issue. But, you know, we apply for grants. We, we, you know, we've got this great thing and I love it. It's called elections where state and federal government, politicians, all of a sudden, their ears get unblocked. And you know what, Chris, they want to hear, what do you think? What, what can I do for you? But that's a very small window. So what's one window of about three months? 
where we really hit them hard for infrastructure funding. And last, last federal election, we got $17 million in funding. And at the last state election, it was nearly $4 million in funding. Now, they're on top of what we can get as rates. But, Chris, the, the thing that bugs me the most about our finances is a thing called cost shifting. Now, you might call it something else over there, but where governments put their shift their costs from them to us. Now you take, we've got libraries and I know you've got libraries, so I've been to libraries in uh, Vancouver. Um, well, we've got an agreement with our state government, we fund those 50-50. Now, Chris, 50-50 means I pay half, you pay half. Well, our state government are currently paying 22%. So if you and I went out for a meal and we split the bill and that's a hundred bucks and I put 22 on the table and said, see you, Chris, had a great night. You go, hang on, that's not fair. And, but that's happening with, you know, so many services in uh, in Victoria, both federal and state government, have cost shifted to my city $19 million each and every year. So the first $19 million I receive out of that 3.8% that of taxes goes to paying for what the government used to pay for, but no longer do. And that's really difficult. The local ratepayer, if I tell them that, oh, you, Jim, you're just having a whinge. Bloody oath, I'm having a whinge. It's a fair whinge, but it's true. And every time I go to a politician and say, what are you going to do about it? It's scratch the head, scratch the leg, um, 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 that's all you hear. But I know in the lead up to the next election, they're going to say to me, Jim, we're ready to listen. Because you know what? You've got something I need. You've got people. I need their votes. So what can I do to get their votes? So, it's very difficult. So there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> Yeah, there, there is. First off, I just want to clarify for the, uh, for my Canadian listeners, rate caps, we do not have them in Canada. Uh, we, we, as you've seen in Canada, we have one municipality raising their uh, mill rate, their taxes, property taxes, 39%. We have one municipality raising their taxes, 8%. We have one raising their taxes, 16%. So we have no mill rate. Second, uh, we have, we call it downloading where the provincial government or federal government just happens to give you more responsibilities to local government. Government. So I just wanted to clarify that. Sure, so sure, it begs sure. the question because as a municipal, as a local councillor in your community of the city of Glen Eyre, you have to make tough decisions. You have yeah. to make the tough decisions and you have to say, okay, Jim's issue is not going to be a big issue for the budget this year. Johnny's issue is not going to be a big issue, but Sandra's is. How do you see your role and how does your council see their role in ensuring that everyone feels like their taxes are being spent wisely and everyone's getting a fair treatment on those taxes. Chris, we're very clear in the city of Glenora, we run 120 different services. Now they're the services our community tell us are important to them. So they're the ones that you, you want to keep. So you look at that. Now, a particular councillor comes up with a, a great idea you know, we want to start sending um, satellites into space. We would have to look at that and go, well, where's that money going to come from? That's an expensive exercise. So ultimately, the 120 services are what's really important. And, and on top of that, we just started a brand new swimming pool. Now, that was not in our budget a few years ago. We've had to borrow heavily for that. Over $70 million we had borrowed for that. But the aquatic centre I was talking about earlier that I had the pleasure of having get built, has never cost ratepayers any money. It's fully self-sufficient and it's actually making money. So that's the one, the catalyst that's going to help pay the second pool. We've also got 4,000 children learning to swim in that, in that pool at the moment. And that's going to flow onto the new pool and it'll be a big major learn to swim. So it will actually, it's a big part of our infrastructure and a big part of our spend, but we wouldn't have done it if it was just going to lose money every year. So we put a lot of work into that, but look, I bring things to council each year, um, other councillors do, and we talk it amongst ourselves, but Chris, it all gets down to lobbying, lobbying your other councillors to get what you need. Now, I tell my residents often, councils themselves do not make decisions, councillors make the decisions, councils give recommendations. So if you want something done in your city, I've got nine councillors in my electorate, in my city of Glen Iron. any five of them, and we're all very reasonable and, and, and straightforward. Any five of them can actually get things happening. Four of them can't. And it's easy to get four votes on council. It's bloody hard to get the fifth. So by the time you do that, and if it's something out of our long-term financial strategies, um, you know it's been well-researched, well-governed, 
and it's something that we can actually do. We don't go out for wild ideas. Um, it's just too hard when you're, you're rate capped and the new rate cap's been put down. It's now 3.5%, so it doubled, but inflation's still way up over 6%. So uh, it's, it's harder for councillors to get things out of the normal up. How important is it to work together in that situation? Because you're right. You were one vote on council, even as mayor, Absolutely. you were one vote of nine. But yep. at the end of the day, your side might not win. Your side might be that four. Your side might be that five. At the end of the day, you have to go away and still work together as a team and make the yep. city move forward. How important is it for you? And I'm talking about you alone here to ensure that there's a respect that, you know what, what we say at council, what we debate at council doesn't spill over and affect our personal working relationship. Chris, I'm probably the least educated councillor on my council. My council group are very educated, very professional, and they're very they're top operators. Um, I'm in awe often of what they say and the detail they pick up in reports. Um, for me personally, it's I always leave the council meeting um, as a council meeting and go upstairs and have a cup of tea and a biscuit after the meeting and celebrate another great meeting. Whether I win, whether I lose, it's all about benefiting our community. And if the majority of councillors go one way and I go another, then they're representing the majority of our residents. You lose some, you win some, you high five when you win, you go home and you tell the dog to get outside when you lose, you know. But you wake up the next morning, the sun's out, it's beautiful Australia, and we just come back and we get on with it. But look, there's things we that you win, things you lose. Um, but you've got to just not take it personally, but it's hard not taking it personally. We have three areas within Glenora. Each area has three councillors. So you're working as a sort of a group of three for your province. That's about to change. We're about to move into nine areas with nine councillors and you're on your own, buddy. Um, so lobbying is going to be different, difficult, different, but you still need the support of the a majority of councillors to do anything. Can I challenge you on that a little bit? Because I, cool. I, I heard your conversation with Chris, Chris Eddy, and I, I hate to plug another show, but you should go listen to the interview with Chris Eddy and yeah. uh, Councillor McGee. Um, you're right. They're changing to nine wards. You're currently three wards with three councillors in each ward. But you're, right. you're, you're not a ward councillor. You're a Glen Ira councillor, are you not? Yeah. You have to look yeah. at every issue, not as a ward issue, but a city issue. Yeah, yeah. Chris, it's very naive to think councillors do that. I'll, I'll introduce you to a few in Canada, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, we've got we've got the smallest amount of open space out of any council in Victoria. So our, our sporting grounds are small. So when I want to upgrade a pavilion so that children can actually come and get changed, um, we'll see one area having three pavilions built and another area not having any. So, you know, you lobby hard for your little patch. You know, like and I'm the biggest whinger. You know, when am I going to get the, what I deserve? You know, when is my city going to get the pavilion that, you know, the Rostown Ward um, got or the Camden Ward got? Um, and I've complained year after year, but it's paid off, Chris. Last year, we bought seven properties in my ward and we're turning them into open space. You know, it's 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 really, really good. Smallest amount of open space out of any council in Victoria. And we're purchasing homes with money we are raising through developers. So, Chris, any developer in Glen Ira who subdivides a block of land more than twice, or puts more than two dwellings on it, pays 8.3% of the value into an open space fund. And that open space fund is used then to buy new open space. So it's not rate payers money, it's, it's an open space levy. And maybe that's something um, those in Canada, if they hear this, they could have a little think about or jump on our website and have a look at how it works. But the developers want to develop, but it's going to cost them, if they do more than two, it's going to cost them 8.3% of the value of the land. Wow. Um, and it you works. Talk, it works great. <laughs> I, I can imagine. Well, if, if if you're getting what you want for your communities, of course it's working, right? I, I want to turn to something you said earlier on in the interview, because it's a, it's a subject that I talk about a lot here on the show, and it's the jurisdictional roles that each level of government plays. Uh, local government for you, state government and federal government. Does the average resident understand the jurisdictional roles that people, the, the each level of government, and how do you see your role as councillor and even as mayor in addressing those issues? Because when people come to you, because you are the closest to the people, the local government, you can't just tell them that's a federal issue, that's a state issue, go talk to your yeah. state or federal issue, uh, MP or yeah. MLA. How do yeah. you deal with those issues? Chris, I used to do that. 
I used to say that that state issue, go see your, you know, um, Mr. Stakos, the local member or the federal member. Um, now I, I'm, I'm a lot smarter. I now explain that, you know, we have council roads, we have state roads. State roads are funded through um, national um, funding policies to fund national roads. So we try and explain that, you know, your street, I can do your street, I can fix your street, but when I get to the end of your street, I can't touch the next bit because that's a state government road and they won't let us touch it. I can't mow the centre of the nature strip, even though the grass is getting tall, because a state authority controls that. I'd love to, but I just can't. So it's it's an educational thing. And even sometimes, Chris, I'm still learning as to where our boundaries finish and state and federal government's boundaries continue. And I think that's quite deliberate on state and federal government because they want us to believe we're responsible for everything because that way they get us to pay for everything. But it's education and, and most people are starting to get that. But there's a lot in it, a lot in that. There's there's a lot in it. And in Canada, what I often hear is those those questions are not often questions about wanting to speak to their federal or state uh, representative. They want just someone to listen to them and then address their issues them as a, their local official. Do you get that a lot, that people are just coming to actually unload on you and say, okay, now it's your problem. Go deal with it. And Chris, often I take that on because it's easier for me to ring up the local state member and say, look, this is becoming an issue. Can you deal with it for me? And this is the resident or this is the group. And I do it with, and I've got a great relationship with my state um, politicians and my federal politicians. Um, some of them are dear friends. So I have got their, mess their emails and their, their text messages and their private phone numbers. And I, Chris, I've got no problems bringing them up and saying, listen, you need to really, you know, get on top of this. This is becoming a big issue. Um, and often, often they will do it or they'll get back to me and say, Jim, we'll try to, but that's going to be in next year's budget. And I'll get back to the person and say, look, I understand you want that upgrade. There's no money in this year's budget, but it is being looked at next year. So when I see it, I'll let you know and you can directly lobby your state uh, or federal uh, MP. So, yeah, you, you become that sort of intermediary. On the flip side of the jurisdictional roles is the apathy. In Canada, we see a massive apathy when it comes to local government. People are not running for municipal office anymore. People are not even attending council meetings anymore. Are you seeing in Glen Ira or even in uh, the uh, the country of Australia, people wanting to get involved in a local government these days? Chris, absolutely. Um, every election I've I've been in, I've been in five elections now, um, there's always been a cast of 20 or more looking at three spots. And that's in each ward. Um, state government's the same, federal government's the same. Everyone like me, everyone wants to be the prime minister. Chris, I want to be the prime minister. Let me be the prime minister tomorrow and I'll change the world. But I'll start with my little patch in East Bentley. But uh, it's, no, there's no, there's no shortage of people wanting to step forward. And Chris, that's really terrific. And, you know, you look for young, you look for new ideas, fresh ideas, people with energy, you know, people like me are starting to get to the other end. We're starting to get a bit cynical, you know, the energy starting to run out. And we're looking for the next level, the next um, cohort to come through to bring us into the next, you know, the next 10, the next 15 years. Um, and they're there. They're certainly there. Is it hard to identify those people? Because some people might get into local government for the wrong reasons. And there, there are people out there who do get in for the wrong reasons. And I say that because, like you said, they're the, the ego driven. They want to be uh, they want to make the decisions and they want to be the person in the chair to make those decisions. But when you get there, it is a completely different uh, basket. So when you yeah. see people who are potentially successors or people wanting to get involved, is it easy to tell the good versus the bad uh, potential counsellors? I can pick it um, when they're walking 100 metres towards me. Um, and within the first 10 minutes of a conversation, you know who's um, a troublemaker, you know who wants to get on council to sack the planning department or, you know, put all the money here or, you know, it's a stepping stone to get a profile, to get into state politics, to get into federal politics. And it is a, a good training ground for politicians, local government, because you are dealing one-on-one, -on -one, you are learning meeting procedures, you are dealing with, you know, multi-multi-million dollar um, projects that you have to put your hand up at the end of the day and go, with my heart, I, I'm approving this because I think it's best for my city. So it is a good training ground. But you, look, you can spot them a long way away. And I steer clear of them very, very quickly. Um, but 
there's some really interesting um, characters coming out of the woodwork for our elections next year. And I think it's going to be a very interesting council. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm probably thinking I'm not going to run again. And I've been actually telling people I'm not going to run again, but I've said that five times. So we'll see. So what makes a good counselor then? In your in your own opinion, what makes a good counselor? Uh, Chris, someone who one can listen, listen less and, you know, I'm oh, sorry, listen more, talk less. Now, that's one of the hard things I had. I was talking more than I was listening. I've learned how to listen a lot. Someone who's from the local area, someone who understands the community that they're in, and they want to get on to council to actually make a difference. They see an issue. Now, the issue might not be a big issue to me or to others, but it's a big issue to them. So we need to air that. We need to have them at that table for that discussion. Some of them don't, in the end, run for council, but they've aired their concerns and they, they see a, a way forward. Um, but it's really, really important that those people keep coming forward. I don't like the parachuting in of a candidate. You know, we see that in the state government all the time. You know, our little area, they'll parachute somebody in from way, way out, 100 kilometres away and become our member of parliament. They would not know us from a bar of soap, Chris, but they're representing us in parliament. And I think that's that's pretty poor. But uh, look, you can spot these people really quickly. And there's some really good, decent, hardworking um, parents. They're their mums, their dads, they're single people, they're people from ethnic communities. Look, all sorts run for council. And you know what, Chris, we need all sorts on council. I want to turn to my second segment here because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy sure. councillor. So, and I want to talk about the city as a whole now. And I want to start by prefacing this question by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. He has one vote. He needs five others to make anything pass on council. So don't come for him. But in your opinion, uh, Jim, what do you see as the biggest issue facing the city of Glen Ira today as of recording? Sure. Chris, without doubt, financial sustainability. Our long-term financial sustainability is at a really at a turning point. And I don't say that lightly. I'm really concerned about the future of our city. We are the lowest rating council in Victoria. No other council in Victoria has higher rates than we do. And I don't wear that as a badge of honour. I wear that as uh, over years and years, we have kept rates so low that when rate capping came in, all councils go up by the same amount. So if you're starting on a very low base and there's other councils on a high base, you're all going up by 3.5% next year, but it's $1,000 in difference per property. Now I've got 60,000 properties I've got to look after, got 150,000 people. Our financial sustainability is at, a, at an all time low. I've never seen our council's um, funds so low where we actually have to start looking at projects we can't fund. We never used to do that. You know, five, 10 years ago, we needed to buy a block of land. We just bought it. Now we're looking at three childcare centres at the moment. They're losing $600,000 a year and they're only 2% of the market. Yet I've got 58 other centres around it with vacancies. So we're looking at the moment, a real, really looking at what do we do with that? Do we close those? and save that $600,000 plus the $140,000 that they cost to maintain? Or do we just keep wearing that and going on? Um, so they're really tough decisions to make, and that's a tough decision for me. When I look around Australia, and I'm the one that's always looking for options, what is someone else doing? What are other councils doing? And I've been listening to all of your little podcasts, and they're fantastic. The, the Mayor Sterling, I just I thought he was terrific. Um, he's Him and I, I think we're somehow... We, we, we come from the same bloodline because um, I love what he said. Uh, but, you know, I look at Brisbane, the city of Brisbane, one council, 140 different suburbs, uh, over 1.2 million people. I've got 38 square kilometres. 38 square kilometres, my whole city, 150,000 people. Just across the road is the next city of Stonington, another 150,000, um, another $200 million budget. Mine's a $200 million budget. Yet we've all got... CEOs, directors of this, directors of that, garden departments, all these areas that could merge together and could actually come together, not, not take them out, but work with us, you know, work with another council to provide services for both councils and reduce the amount of money we need in rates. I need to look at ways of reducing rates, but Chris, one way I could reduce rates today, and we talked about rate capping before, we talked about other levels of government, 
In Victoria, we have a thing called stamp duty. When you buy a house, you pay a tax on buying the house. And each year, if you're not living in it, you pay land tax. Now, land tax and stamp duty, just out of my little 38 square kilometres, is worth $332 million every year to our state government. $332 million every and every year. That That's you don't 10%. see a penny of, do you? No. No. We, and they come back and pull out another $19 million in their cost shifting, the cheeky sods. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 these are the things that get, get me really wild. Um, and, you know, that $19 million is 10% of our, our ratepayers are paying 10% more than they should be because of those um, people in Spring Street. So, look, Chris, financial sustainability is something that is very, very important to me because I would feel like I've failed if my city, my, my city fails. And, and I should feel like I've failed if my city fails. But I look at England, council's going bankrupt. So you know, give me hope. Probably- give me hope, Jim, because it's, <laughs> it you're painting a very bleak picture. And don't get me wrong, municipalities in Canada are, are in the same position. Unfortunately, for unfortunately, I should say in Canada, we can, can municipalities, local governments cannot run deficits in our country. They cannot. Oh. You literally have to pay you. You have a certain amount of money each year, and that's all you can spend. And you cannot go in the black red at all. And it doesn't seem like that's the issue in the UK, which we're going to be talking to a, a local yeah. councillor there in Australia either. Give me a, some some silver lining here that the oh, financial yeah. aspect is not that bleak. Chris, <clears throat> I can do that. Um, I started this conversation about local government financial sustainability some 18 months ago. I was put onto a, a, an advisory panel with the Minister for Local Government and I brought this to the Minister for Local Government. I didn't quite get the reaction I wanted the minister was more, more sort of wanting to echo the, the, you know, the sentiments of her government. But all, all councils in Victoria are now talking about it. We're talking with our local members. We're talking with our federal members. The, the discussion's happening. So we're all at the same table now. And the minister understands that they can't, the governments can't just keep going the way they're going. There needs to be some sort of a circuit bracket put in place. Chris, I'm starting to feel the rhetoric of politicians starting to change. They're starting to sort of... Well, they're starting to make us feel like they're listening. Um, I'm not saying they are, but we're st- I'm starting to feel positive about the future. But, Chris, my, my view has always been if I didn't start this conversation 18 months ago, who would have? And this conversation needed to be started and more people need to get engaged in it worldwide, not just here in, in Glenora. And, Chris, that, you know, I'm not going to, um, you know, pat myself on the back because everyone... When I say something, people go, yeah, that's that's fair. Or, oh, Jim, you're very brave saying that because the minister, you know, the minister's like. And, and we've got a great minister for local government. You know, she is really, really, she's a smart, she's a very smart woman. And, uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for her. But governments are policy driven. So it's got it fit within the policy. And they've also got, you know, a, a really big commitment to the people of Victoria, 7 million people. Um, I've only got 150 to look after. They've got to look after the whole state. So I understand They've got to build huge infrastructure. I've just got to fix the pothole. But, you know, my pothole is just as important as their underground railway um, because that's what affects my people. Chris, I think there is some positivity in the future, but if we stop this conversation now, then that all disappears. So we need the momentum to keep going. We need the momentum of other mayors and other councillors, both in Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, start talking about the same things. Otherwise, amalgamations will be absolutely on the cards and I don't think that's a great outcome for our residents. Oh, you just said the most nastiest word in municipal government here in Canada is the amalgamation word. Um, you talk about financial. And I, I when I speak to municipal leaders here in Canada, it's housing. Housing, housing, housing. There's a shortage of housing. In Glen Eyre, do you see a shortage of housing? Or are you set yeah. that the population is keeping up with the housing uh, supply? No, look, there's some, I think our, our state government are talking about 80,000 homes that are needed in the next 10 years. Um, you know, that's an awful lot. Uh, we're seeing within the city of Glenora, Glenora has always been, you know, the sort of the 600 square metre block of land. Now, almost every one house gets sold these days, gets subdivided and two double storey townhouses gets put up. Our city will double in size over the next probably 30, 40 years. Um, our infrastructure has got to double in size to keep up with it. 
because you're going to have more people on our roads, more people on our footpath. You, and some people say, yeah, but you'll be collecting more rates. And the, the thing I try and educate people the most about is just because there's more houses doesn't mean the rates, you get more rates. It's divided by the number, the amount you need divided by the number you have. So, you know, and people go, oh, no, well, if you have 10 houses, now you've got 20, you're getting 10 extra rates. I said, no, you're dividing the total number by an extra 10. Um, so we're starting to see that sort of starting to ring ring home. But look, there is a huge housing shortage, but also housing for people with disabilities. We've got the NDIS, the National Insurance um, Disability Scheme. NDIS housing is in huge demand. We have young people with disabilities living in nursing homes with our senior citizens. And that, I don't see that as a, it's, that might be lovely to do that, but young people need to be with young people. You know, so they shouldn't be living in nursing homes, so to speak. So, no, there's a huge issue with housing in Victoria throughout the whole of Australia. Um, I'm not sure if it's called the same in Australia, but we have something called nimbyism. People who do not want to see their communities change at all. The ones yeah. who will come and say, do not build another house. Do not change this zoning bylaw. Is that the same in Australia? Please tell me that Canada is not alone in this situation. <laughs> um, Chris, I have people asking me to put up signs saying no vacancies. We're full, um, and it's just it's just ridiculous, you know. Don't you know why are you letting these people build these houses? Because you're just inviting more people to come and live with us, um, you know. They don't realise that state government has the, the state government planning scheme, not the local government planning scheme. We talk about heights and setbacks and open space. State government talk about what's allowed to be built, so that if it complies with state government or uh, state government building codes, then it's allowed. Council can't refuse it. But we do have our own little Glenora planning scheme, which is sort of a micro planning scheme, which means that like the street I live in, you can only build a double storey house. You cannot go the third storey, nine metres max. You cannot go higher. But in our activity centres, shopping centres, you can then start looking at five, ten uh, storey buildings. But yeah, look, there's lots of people saying we're full. No more. Stop it. What does Glenora do great? In your opinion, what is the one thing that your city, your administration, your council do right that you boast about? You tell other municipalities or local governments you're doing it better because Glen Iyer has gotten it, gotten it perfect and it's go, go, going smoothly. Chris, we get absolutely most things right. Um, Chris, Chris, whenever we want to produce something or a new project or put something to the community, we First, discuss it amongst ourselves. We make sure we can financially afford what we're trying to do. Um, and then we go out for a really, um, you know, wide community consultation. Now, what that's done over the years is when we see other groups coming into Glen Iyer, like other sporting codes, they tell us our sporting grounds and pavilions are the best in, they've seen. They tell us our sports and aquatic centre is one of the best in the country. They tell us our aged care facility, which we own, we operate and we run, the only one in Victoria. It's still operating and the residents there absolutely love it. Mind you, it's costing me a few million dollars every year, more than it's uh, earning. So it's a, it's a huge deficit to me. But Chris, what we do really, really well, we engage really, really well. We communicate with our community really, really well. But even a really, really good engagement may only get back 200 people wanting to engage out of 150,000. You know, sometimes we've done surveys and our officers have said to me, but Jim, 70% of the respondents said they didn't want that new park. And I'd say, how many people was there? They said, oh, 10. I said, so seven people don't want it <laughs> out of 150,000. I said, that's not really a survey. You know, that's asking an opinion. Um, so look, Chris, I would easily, and I'm not trying to cop out on the question. I, I guess we engage really, really well. Um, uh, to the best we possibly can before we make a decision because we can't afford to make mistakes, Chris. We just can't afford the money. We can only spend a dollar once. Um, you're not copying it on that question, and I appreciate that answer because I think engagement is number one priority for any municipal, local government, and if you're doing it right, I applaud you for that, and that's just my personal opinion. Thank I you. will turn to my last segment now, and it is my favorite seg segment because – I have promised anyone who has ever come on this show, and I'm making this promise right here, right now, on record, I will come to your community. I will visit it. I will spend my economic dollars. So I'm coming to Glen Ira in 2024. So let's grab a coffee. But while I'm there, 
what else should me and my husband do while we're in Glen Ira? Chris, you can Google a thing called Ripponley Estate. It's a huge mansion within our city. Um, it's got huge, big botanical gardens. Council funds the gardens so our residents can use those gardens as open space. Just around the corner, you've got the biggest Holocaust museum in Australia. Glen Ira is home to the largest Jewish community in Australia. Nearly 20% of our residents are from um, Judaism. Um, you've also got for the kids, Bourne Road Reserve, which is a, a $12 million park we put in probably getting on to 10 years ago now. Um, absolutely amazing park. Uh, Chris, there's so many things. Caulfield Park, the Caulfield Race Course, one of our premier racetracks, um, is just up the road from the town hall. You can see our clock tower from the grandstand. Um, that's really, really uh, important place. Uh, and some of the best coffee and donuts and bagels you will ever eat, well, you'll get those within the city of Glenora. Absolutely. Well, I'm looking forward to it, but I've got to um, ask the yeah. sort of, I want you to pick your favorite child a little bit here, but where do you go to decompress? Where do you go in the community? Just, just let it all go and to escape it all because you know, tomorrow you're going to have to make some tough decisions again. Chris, there's a couple of places. One is called the Coatesville Bowling Club, Lawn Bowl Club. Now, uh, I've, I've been dealing with a little injury, so I haven't bowled for the last two seasons, but I'm getting back to it this season. But I still go down there and meet all my friends and we we, we tell lies to each other about how great we are and what a wonderful world this is. And we even roll a bowl now and again. That's really important to me because that's a very grounding place. Because you go in there, nobody talks politics. Nobody, not interested in politics. We just talk about our kids. We talk about uh, sport. We talk about lawn bowls. Chris, I also love the centre of the Caulfield Race Course. It's 17 big parks, basically all in one. It's a huge area and two lakes. I love just walking around the lakes and I love taking our little dog, Buddy, and Buddy likes to think he can catch some of the birds. He's never caught a bird in his life and he never will, but he, he's got ambition. Um, so, you know, that's a really good place for me. And, of course, you know, uh, being spending time with the family. And, and that's, you know, to me, that's that's what it's all about. I got onto council really to make our city a better place, ultimately for my family and, uh, you know, for everyone else's family that lives here. So, you know, re regardless of where I go, I'm at ease. Um, and But I do need time out. And there's times where you see people just at the shops and the last thing you want to hear is, yeah, my footpath, my tree, my pothole. And I keep thinking to myself, my God, can I get away from this? I, I love that that still happens in Australia compared to Canada. Yeah. Um, so I have the million dollar question now, and it's the most okay. important question I ask on these shows. And for you, it's no exception. In sure. your opinion, what makes the city of Glen Iris such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? 120 different nationalities live in my city. So it's a very, very diverse multicultural centre. We have everything from the Diwali celebrations to we're about to do Hanukkah in the park. We have got, uh, you know, our carols by candlelight this Friday night. We are incredibly multicultural. Um, and the events that are around, Party in the Parks, which our council runs, is just, that's what really our city is about. It's about our multiculturalism. Um, and our community, you know, there's multicultural communities where all of the Greek community live over here and all the Jewish community live over there, the, the Italian. Within Glen Ira, that's getting very mixed. We're starting to get away from that. And we've become a very multiracial, multiracial community where everyone lives in the same street. You know, I can get advice just in my street about anything that's happened with the Jewish people, the Indian people, the Greek people. Within my council alone, Councillor Zhang, born in China. Our current mayor, the fabulous Anne-Marie Cade, born in Sri Lanka. I was born in Ireland. That is a, the diversity of our council. We have Greek, uh, Anthony Thanasopoulos, a, a Greek council. Like, we're very well governed. We're very well, um, you know, uh, we get the voice. We get the voice of everyone in our community. That's what makes our community special, our people. 
Jim, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I, I know I said uh, 40 minutes and I think we just hit the 40 minute mark. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day and talking to a Canadian podcaster from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, I, I appreciate you doing this and I appreciate you serving your community because it, you, you've painted a vibrant picture of Glen Ira and I'm looking forward to visiting in 2024 and seeing it up close and personal and hopefully meeting you in person as well. Well, Chris, you will, and you may even see me over in Canada, in Wyoming, Ontario, uh, sometime soon. I've got some friends there, and I'm going to visit. Thank you so much for joining us on a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Um, we couldn't imagine that we had a great guest like we had today. Uh, we we often find ourselves only talking about municipal issues in Canada, but it's so great to get a different perspective. Someone from outside of Canada talking about municipalities. So thank you so much. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you have gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics in Australia. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow in 2024, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you have come to expect for us. So mark your calendars, because as I said last week, we will be back on February 5th with brand new episodes of the cross-border interviews. And yes, for those who are listening, we will be sprinkling in some international stories along the way in 2024. So your engagement is what fuels our passion. And remember, as I've always said, stay informed, stay engaged, and Happy New Year's. We'll see you in 2024.